action were a major contribution to the success. Attention, please. Our meeting is ready to continue. Ladies and gentlemen, our speaker is in the hall, so let's get back to our meeting. This is a landmark meeting for the Kipps Bay Group. We celebrate our first anniversary. As it's a special event, we have asked a special friend to speak to us tonight. To many of us, he's an old friend, and for some of you, we hope he will become a new one. Usually, the Kipps Group is a closed meeting for alcoholics only. Due to tonight's special circumstances, we have opened the meeting to our families and friends. Our only request is that our guests respect the wishes of the group. Those wishes are as follows. What you hear here tonight, take it home with you. Who you see here and meet here, leave that knowledge behind. Anonymity is the spiritual backbone of our program. Again, please help us maintain this spiritual legacy. Before introducing our speaker, I'll read AA's statement of purpose as written in the foreword of the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. We are not an organization in the conventional sense of the word. There are no fees nor dues whatsoever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. We are not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. And now to our speaker. He has been called the greatest social architect of our century. The 12-step program he developed, America's greatest invention. His extraordinary energy and action were a major contribution to the success of our fellowship. Without that contribution, we would more than likely not be here tonight. Lord knows where I would be. <laughs> It can be said of Bill that there were moments in his life, and he gave his life to those moments. Please welcome the co-founder of Alcoholics Anonymous to share some of those moments with us tonight. Please welcome Bill W. Bill. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. I, I'm sorry I'm late, folks. I, uh, well, there's a chance that we weren't going to even get here tonight. Uh, I understand some of you in the hall already know what has happened today, but uh, it's come as a, a terrible shock. And well, well, here, let me read the telegram that we received one o'clock this afternoon. Dear Uncle Bill, well, it's addressed to William G. Wilson, the Alcoholic Foundation, New York, New York. Dear Uncle Bill, Dad slipped away peacefully at noon today at the Akron Hospital. We'll call you later with the funeral arrangements. Our love to you and Aunt Lois. And it's signed Sue and Bob Jr. Dr. Bob, my partner, your friend, our friend, died today. As I said, I wasn't going to come, but Lois, my wife, said, what better place could you come to than a, a meeting of Bob's friends? I also got a call from Ed Downing, Father Ed Down in St. Louis, and he said, go, he said, go, it'll do you a lot of good. He said, just don't talk about yourself. Talk about Bob. Talk about the beginning. Tell our story. Don't just tell your story. He said, make it an Irish lake. And thinking about that, I, I decided that I would come, and I will share with you. So please, if I'm a little out of kilt here, uh, just realized that I got some tragic news today. I did, though, on the way over, take a minute to, to jot down a few notes to sort of commemorate the event of this group's anniversary. And with your permission, I'd like to get that out of the way before we begin the meeting. We meet tonight to celebrate this group's anniversary, first anniversary, and the life of Dr. Bob Smith. We thank God that he has freed many of us out of bondage. And we're here to tell all our friends about deep gratitude for all the help they have given us in this wholesale miracle of recovery and to share with them and with each other the sure evidence of God's greatness. So much for speech making. We don't make speeches, we just tell our stories. Tonight, though, it'll be a little bit different. It'll be our story. Well, let me see, where do I begin? I guess for us, uh, for me anyway, the beginning was 16 years ago, 1934. The end of the summer, September. I was a patient up in Charlie Towns' hospital up on Central Park West. I had been a patient there before. This, 
This was my fourth visit, third time that year. And I was upstairs, wrapped up in one of Charlie's canvas pajama tops. You remember the ones that tied in the back? And my wife, Lois, she was downstairs. She was talking to Dr. Silkworth, and he was telling her what he had just, just maybe an hour or so before, told me. He was telling her that my drinking, which had once been just a habit, had now become an obsession. And that my body, at last, had developed an allergy to the very substance that I craved. And that I was dying. And that I was an alcoholic. He had this concept, this theory, after treating thousands of men like myself, that mine was a disease. A disease as any other disease, and a disease that was sure to kill me if I was left to my own. And it was his earnest suggestion that Lois commit me into the Rockland State Hospital for the insane. You could do that then as a chronic inebriate, and he, he wanted to do that because he knew I was killing myself. But all Lois could say is, but doctor, you don't understand. I never met a man like Bill who, when he made his mind up, could do anything. Uh, why can't he stop this drinking? And again, he repeated he has a disease. Hard to understand, harder to treat, but a disease nevertheless. And that he better follow her advice, his advice. Lois, of course, was distraught, and I was upstairs going over those words myself, and I was just as distraught, just trying to say, why me? You know, typically alcoholic, why me? Why did this happen to me? And I went back over my life, and I could see certain events, perhaps, that brought me on the road to it, but why me? I, I, I did not set out to be this way. Perhaps uh, if I had to look for a reason was the fact that my father had a problem with alcohol. That was the reason for my parents' divorce when I was eight years old. My sister and I and my mother were abandoned by my father as a result of his drinking. My mother left shortly. I was made to live with my grandparents, my, my mother's parents. My grandfather instilled in me at an early age a strong, strong desire to be number one. And I guess the, the capstone of all of that was at 12, in my earnest rush to be number one, I invented, or was in the record books as an inventor, the, the first American boomerang. Uh, I had uh, gotten a book from Grandpa when I was 12 on my birthday that, in passing it to me, he said, you know, the aboriginal is the only one that can make a boomerang. And I, I just went after that tooth and nail to prove that I could be an equal to an aborigine. And after six months, a six-month power drive, I created the first boomerang. It worked. And from that day on, my grandfather started it off. I was a number one man in his eyes and as far as he was concerned in everybody else's eyes. But realizing at the time that I was setting up an emotional boomerang that was going to last me the rest of my life. The need to be number one in everything I did. So perhaps that was the reason for my, my turning alcoholic. I only drank for 17 years. Picked up my first drink when I was 22 in the Army. Stationed up in Massachusetts with my wife. 22, 17 years later, I'm lying in a hospital bed, an alcoholic. Made a fortune in those 17 years and lost it. Not much to my fault, but some of it, but a lot of it due to the crash in 29. That began the in and outs of the institutions because when that happened, I also crashed. I was a hopeless drunk. A lot of problems with alcohol. In and out of sanitariums, drying out places, hospitals, rest homes. Lost everything we had. Everything. Now here I am, 39 years old, and a doctor wants to put me in the hospital for the rest of my life. Well, I begged Lois not to follow his advice. When she came to see me, I begged her to give me one more chance, and God bless her, she did, and she, she brought me home to our home. In reality, it wasn't our home, it was my brother-in-law's. We were living rent-free over on Clinton Street in Brooklyn Heights. Lois had a job in a downtown Brooklyn department store making $22 a week. Everything we had that was of any value had been so long before this. And I was a chronic drunk. But she brought me home anyway, and she gave me that one last chance. And in the next two months, I proved the doctor wrong. Totally, absolutely wrong. I didn't leave the house, but I got sober. Stark raving sober, I guess you'd call it, but I got sober. After two months of just staying inside that house, I knew that the doctor had made a mistake. I was not an alcoholic. I was not a drunk. And then, Armistice Day, 1934, a beautiful, smashing day, positively brilliant. I looked out the window after breakfast and seeing how great it was, I said to my wife, Lois, I said, honey, I want to play some golf today. This is perhaps the last good day of the year, and I want to get in a round of golf before winter sets in. I felt like a million dollars. 
And she tried to stop me as best she could. She said, don't get stronger, get stronger. But I, I insisted. And finally she relented and she gave me a few dollars. And I went up to the attic and I dug out the old golf bag and I walked down to the Staten Island Ferry. The club was over in Staten Island. Actually, it was my brother-in-law's club. I could play and he'd pay. I walked to the ferry, took the ride over, and as I said, it was a positively beautiful day, and I felt like a million dollars. On the other side, I boarded the bus to take me to the clubhouse, and I'm getting in the bus, I noticed the fellow that was carrying a rifle. Now, I don't know about you, but in New York, if I see somebody with a gun, I want to keep a good eye on him. So I decided the best thing for me to do was to sit alongside him. And after a few stops, I said to him, hey, mister, where are you going with that rifle? And he just told me, he said, I'm going to a shooting match. As it turned out, it was at a gun club right next door to the very golf course that I was going to play on. There was this gun club, and he was going to shoot that afternoon. Now, having raised in Vermont, I fancied that I knew everything there was about rifles, and I began to tell him everything I knew. As it turned out, he knew a lot more than I did, so at the end of it, just to be number one in the conversation, I threw in what I knew about the artillery, having been in the artillery during the First World War. And lo and behold, I became number one in the conversation. He was impressed. And we were settling down for a very comfortable ride when all of a sudden the bus was rear-ended by a taxi cab. We had to unload to see the damage, and there wasn't much, just a few bumps and bruises, but nothing of any significance. But it was sufficient that the, the driver, the bus driver, had to wait for, to make out a police report, so they called for a replacement bus to continue the trip. I was standing on the curb, my newfound friend and I, when he spots an old speakeasy across the street. He says to me, why don't we wait there? He said, it'd be a lot more comfortable, and the driver can come for us when the new bus arrives. I said, sounds like a good idea to me, so we crossed the street, and we knocked on the door, and they opened it up for us, and we got in, and sat at the bar, and the bartender came up and said to my friend, he said, what will you have? And he asked for a whiskey and ginger ale, as I recall. And of me, they said, what would you like? And I said, just the ginger ale, thank you. And he turned to me, my newfound friend, and he said, you don't drink? And I said, no, I don't drink. And then for some reason that I'm still to this day not quite sure why, I decided to tell him my life story with alcohol, blow by blow, dollar by dollar, hospital by hospital, everything that I lost, everything over the years that caused me pain and horror and heartbreak and just everything. And he listened. And when I finished, he said a wondrous thing to me. He said, you know, you're a remarkable man. And immediately I knew that he was an intelligent man because nobody, and I mean nobody, had, had a kind word to say to me in years. But this man could see through all of me and get to the very nub of it and see that I was a number one, a highly intelligent man. He said, as I recall, I have a, a number of friends that have had problems with alcohol, much like your own. He said, they're dead now. Or they're in prison. Or they're in hospitals. Well, they're in Skid Row, but you seem to have rebounded, to have recovered. And I, I think that's highly remarkable. The more he talked, the smarter he got in front of me. It was just, as I said, nobody, and I mean nobody had had a kind word for him. Well, good things have to come to an end, and the driver finally came, and it was about the new bus, and we, uh, we boarded and continued our trip. After a mile or so, I didn't want to let this fellow loose. As I said, I, I needed this affirmation. So I said, why don't you join me for lunch at my club? It was my brother-in-law's, but as far as he was concerned, it was my club. I'll stand you to lunch because you're not going to start shooting, as he had told me, until 2 o'clock, and I wasn't going to tee off until 1.30, and it was just a few minutes before noon. I said, why don't you join me? We'll have lunch, and at the end of lunch, you can walk out the back door of the clubhouse and cross a small field, and you'll be at the gun club in a matter of minutes. He liked the idea and he agreed. And so when my stop came, we both got off and entered into the country club. And we were walking to the dining room and we were stopped by the manager. And he said, can I help you? And I said, no, we're just going for a bite of lunch. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. I, I apologize. But the, the dining room was closed today in celebration of Armistice Day. We've given the staff a day off. But you can, if you'd like, you can get a sandwich in the bar. My friend said to me, will that bother you? And I said, no, I, not at all. I've already passed the test. I've gotten out of that saloon in one piece. I'm sure I could do it again. So we crossed over. We went into the bar and sat up on the bar stools. And eventually the bartender came over to service. And he said, well, you have. And my friend again asked for a whiskey and ginger ale. And I asked for a ginger ale. And we ordered sandwiches. And 
my friend, as I said, was getting smarter by the minute. He said, you know, you're fantastic. He said, you're in a sea of alcohol. And there were bottles all over the place. I mean, it was uh, just loaded with every type of liquor you can imagine. He said, you are remarkable. You're uh, just absolutely a wonder because you're in a sea of booze and it's still not pulling at you. I, I knew that I was cured. The doctor had made a mistake. I was so delighted. I, was, I couldn't wait to tell my wife. Well, we drank our drinks and we had our sandwiches and finally I asked the bartender for the bill so I could sign it so my brother-in-law wouldn't have any problems paying it. And we were about ready to leave when the bartender came back over and he put down two mixed drinks. One in front of me and one in front of my friend. And he said, gentlemen, these drinks are on the house in celebration of Armistice Day. And without a moment's hesitation, I reached over and I picked up mine and I drank it down. When I turned to my newfound friend, he didn't look smart anymore. He had the dumbest expression I've ever seen on a human being. And all he could say to me is, Mister, you've got to be crazy. Absolutely crazy. After what alcohol has done to you, for you to take that drink, you must be insane. And all I could say was, you're right, I, I am insane. I am crazy. That night, my wife found me in the areaway, the, the space between the outside door and the inside door of our home. I had fallen, apparently cut my head, and I was bleeding past her. Still clutching that, that bag of unused golf clubs. I didn't play golf that day. I, I got drunk and proved the doctor right. The next morning, full of remorse and pain and self-pity, I knew what I was. I knew that I was an alcoholic. And I'd be one the rest of my life. And I guess when I died and they pulled the grass over my head, I'd, I'd be a dead alcoholic. And there was nothing I could do about it. But I also knew that I'd be damned before I'd die in some insane asylum. I decided then and there that I would drink myself to death or get the Dutch courage that I needed to take my life. And that's what I set out to do. For the next several weeks, I begged, borrowed, or stole the dollar bill it took to get the three little bottles of gin that it also took to get me over the edge, to get me drunk. Day in and day out, I sat in that, that empty house in Brooklyn, drinking myself to death, occasionally writing angry letters to Franklin Delano Roosevelt, telling him what a lousy job he was doing running the country. Letters I want to show you right now, he never replied to. I don't think Lois ever mailed them. But that was my future, and that was my end, and I couldn't care less. And that's how Ebby found me. Ebby T., some of you might know, from the rooms. I got a call one day. Old Ebby, my school chum, he said, Hey, Bill, this is Ebb. Can I come over to see you? And I said, Oh, Ebby, please, please do. I hated to drink alone. I truly did. Here was my old pal uh, coming over to, to share an afternoon. We could reminisce and talk about the old days and... It would be wonderful. I said, oh, please come over, Ab. And he said he'd be right over. And I, I then did what I consider to be a very heroic act for a, a drunk of my nature. I, I dug out the one little bottle of gin that I had sequestered behind the commode in the downstairs john. And I put that on the kitchen table. And because I remembered that Eddie had a kind of a sour stomach, I also rescued a can of pineapple juice from one of Lois's pantry shelves. And I put that on the table and waited for my friend looking forward to a splendid afternoon because I was sure he'd bring a jug to and we'd have a great time. And while I was waiting, I was trying to recall an event of uh, friends of ours, friends of Evie and I had passed on to me about him being in a kind of a scrape not too long ago, maybe a month or so before his call today. And it seemed that Ed in one of his binges had run his car into somebody's living room up near Albany. When he climbed out of the wreckage, there was a woman sitting on the sofa, and he said to her, Madam, would you please get me a cup of coffee? And we all laughed about it because she got the cops instead. I must ask him when he comes, how did you get out of that scrape, baby? I'd, I'd like to know for future reference. That was a, a real, real bad scrape. I must ask him. Well, I didn't have long to wait. The, there was a knock on the door, and I went to answer it. And as soon as I opened it and took one look, I knew that something had changed. There was something different about him. He was clean, for one. His suit was nicely sponged and pressed. He had a 
blocked hat, the shoes were shined, and he was clean shaven. I knew how I looked. I always knew how I looked. I had a pair of baggy trousers, wearing an undershirt, three or four day growth of beard. I used to go around with my brother-in-law's house slippers on. They were size and a half too big for me, so I couldn't walk exactly. I had to slide around the house. Lois used to love that. She would say to friends, he polishes the linoleum wherever he goes. And that's how I looked. Well, he said a few pleasantries in the uh, parlor, and finally I said, Eddie, let's go back to the uh, kitchen where it's a lot warmer and where I knew the gin was. I also happened to know, by the way, that he wasn't carrying a jug. He was empty-handed. Hmm, maybe he's broke. Well, he followed me back, and we sat at the kitchen table, and we shared a few more pleasantries, and finally, both of us are eyeing the bottle of gin and the can of pineapple juice. I said to him, Ed, how would you like a little drink? And I reached over and I started to pour one out. And he said, no, Bill. He said, no, thank you. Not today. I said, you're not drinking? I said, you're on the water wagon, Abby? He said, no, I'm not. I'm just not drinking today. So what happened, old friend? I, this, is, this is news to me. He said, well, I guess you could say I got religion. Oh, my God, I thought. I've let a religious nut in my house. And then I realized, well, that isn't such bad news because now all this liquor is mine. I don't have to share it. And I'm sure it'll outlast any rantings and ravings he might have about whatever religion he picked up. So I said, what, what religion have you found, Ed? And he said, very matter-of-factly, he said, I guess you'd call it the religion of common sense. I had never heard of Our Lady of the Common Sense, so I dug a little further. I said, what do you mean, common sense? Well, he said, Bill, I don't know if you realize how much of a grip alcohol had on me. And right away, I knew I wasn't going to tell him about what I knew. I said, no, Ab. I said, you, you have a problem with alcohol? He said, oh, yeah. He said, a, a very, very severe problem. Why, just a little over a month ago, he says, I was in a judge's chambers, and they were getting ready to throw the book at me and lock me up. I had gotten into the one scrape too many, and my family wanted me off the streets. And while I was in that chamber, friends of ours, and he mentioned their names, and they were friends of mine, too, and he said, also a perfect stranger, he mentioned his name, and he was a stranger to me also. He, he said, these people came to that hearing. And the stranger stood before the judge, and he said, Your Honor, turn him over to us. I think we can help him solve his problem. They're members of the Oxford group, Bill. Have you heard of those? And I had. I said, yes, I, I know a little about them, having read some articles and some stories over the years in the society columns, a bunch of fancy dance that got together to overcome whatever drinking or drugging or gambling problems they might have. But I, it was a subject that I didn't want to know that much about, so I said, I don't know that much. He said, well, he said, I, I got involved with these people. The judge had nothing to lose, so he just turned me over to him. And after a while, listening to him, I took certain ideas peculiar to them, and I put it to work on my drinking problem. And it seems to have done the trick for me. Well, if you're in for a penny, you're in for a pound. And I said, well, what are those ideas, my friend? And he said, well, number one, I had to get honest with myself for the first time in my life and take a look at what alcohol had done to me. And then he said, I had to talk it over with somebody else. In strict confidence, now I want to show you that, in strict confidence, I had to talk it out with somebody else. And then he said, I had to become willing to make up for all the harm that I've done with my drinking and with other things. I'll be doing that the rest of my life. Then also, he said, I had to also become willing to help people like myself. And when I heard that old Bill Wilson was holed up over in Brooklyn, drinking himself to death, I said to my friends, let me take a crack at him. And that's why I'm here today. Well, I was offended. I said, wait a minute, Ed, I don't know who gave you that idea that I was drinking myself to death, but you're, you're wrong. I might be having a couple of bad spots here, but I'm certainly not doing that. Well, I said, all right, I could be mistaken, he said. And I said, well, is that what you picked up all the ideas? He said, no, there was one other. And he said, I know it's going to jar you, Bill, but I have to tell you this nevertheless. I know where you stand on this issue, but I had to also come up with asking God for help to do those other four things to keep me straight and keep me on the beam. I had to ask whatever God I could come up with for help. And I know that jars you. And he was right. And I said to him, thank you, but no thanks. And we got up, and I walked him to the door, and I saw him off. So much for a 
pleasant afternoon with my friend Ed. The idea, somebody coming into my house and talking about some personal arrangement with a, a god was just absolutely ridiculous. I'm an engineer by training and I, I do allow for the natural order of things and I can conceivably consider a supreme consciousness but the idea of some some personal deity that you can help overcome life's problems was absolutely ludicrous so much for my friend Ebby I went back to drinking but a funny thing happened over the next couple of days I couldn't get a sight of Ebby out of my mind he became another obsession all I could do was think of him sober and me drunk I knew what I was and I kept saying, there's something wrong with this picture. What's wrong? And eventually I realized I should be sober. Because I was the number one man. I was number one in everything. I should be sober. I should be the one talking to the likes of Evie. There's something wrong about this. And the obsession grew and grew and grew until finally I began to realize. Realization, I guess you'd call it. Or a moment there. Yeah, some, some brief moment. I began to realized that had I cancer and Ebby showed up and he told me about a cure for cancer that was in the hands of some quote great physician unquote I would have followed him on my hands and knees to wherever that physician was located had I cancer and yet I had a disease much like cancer it was killing me and I wouldn't do anything about it and the more I thought about it the more I realized that I was definitely insane but I had to check this out I made a living as an investigator, as a security analyst. I could analyze this Oxford group. I could take a good, hard look at them and see perhaps if they could help me. I could do it on the QT. Nobody would have to know. Perhaps Lois, but nobody else. Maybe Ebby, if he saw me there. But I would go over to where they met, and I'd observe them. And if they had something for me, perhaps I'd take what I want and leave the rest behind. So I told Lois about my idea one evening and she, God bless her, she, she helped me. The next day we, we cleaned me up. And finally that afternoon, with a few dollars that she gave me, I took the subway into Manhattan to, to check out the Oxford group. They used to meet over at the Calvary Mission on 23rd Street. Some of you might remember the place. So. And I, coming up out of the subway, realized immediately that I had made a great mistake. I'd taken the subway over from Brooklyn I went over to the west side of Manhattan instead of the east side where the mission was, which happens to be also the, the longest stretch in New York from the east to the west. And because it was early, I decided, well, it wasn't too bad. It wasn't a bad day. I'd walk over. I had plenty of time. I'd just walk over the few blocks and be there in plenty of time for the meeting. After a few blocks of walking, though, I found myself looking into the windows of some of the saloons that I passed by to see perhaps if there was somebody there I might know. There wasn't. I continued to walk until finally, in desperation, because I was getting closer to the mission, I crossed the street to one of my favorite watering holes. I looked in that window, and there was nobody there that I knew, so I decided perhaps I was missing something. I'd step inside to take a really good look. I stepped inside, and I looked around, and again, there was nobody there I knew, so I thought, why don't you wait? Perhaps somebody's going to show up. And I waited. I don't know about you, but if you're going to wait in a saloon, you should have a drink, because otherwise you'll look conspicuous. So I asked for a beer. I drank it, and then I asked for another beer. And another beer and a shot to go with it. And before you know it, I forgot any plans I had for an evening that hadn't even begun yet. I went into my usual blackout. So much for meeting God in Manhattan. But, as also was my custom, in a little while I came out of the blackout. And I found myself talking to a man with a very heavy accent. As I determined after a minute, he was a fisherman from a Finnish sailboat. A fishing boat, I'm sorry. He was a sailmaker. And I realized that he was a fisherman, but I was in town to talk to fishers of men. This was a mistake. And I said to him, Mister, come with me. We're going to meet God. And because I had a few dollars in my pocket, he came with me. We could drink later. When we got down to the mission. The, the services had already begun. Tex Francisco was at the door, and he, he barred us from coming in because we were too obviously drunk. And Push was coming to shove, and I was getting ready to get my usual beating when... Ebby showed up and he sized up the situation he said to Tex I'll sponsor them in I'll sit on them if they act up I'll scoop them and get them out of there and I got into the mission for those again that re recall the joint the, the smell was overwhelming 
These lads have been living in their clothes for years. Their body waste, uh, an integral part of their body. Urine-soaked trousers, the smell of alcohol was pervasive. The boiling pot of coffee up front was a big, big pot of beans. I, I can still recall it today. It was overwhelming. Me and my Brooks brother soup. Well, I sat amongst them, and Eddie got us a plate of beans and a mug of coffee, and I drank. And I don't know if it was the beans or the coffee or the alcohol, but I eventually began to mellow out. And I began to realize that these weren't uh, a bad bunch of boys. They were just a little further down in their luck than I was. As I mellowed out, apparently I went into another one of those blackouts. Because what happened after that was retold to me by Ebby the next morning. It seems that in my blackout, halfway through somebody's witness, I got up with the sweet, with the sin, and came forward to accept Christ. And before you know it, I was singing old camp songs, playing the tambourine, and jumping for Jesus, and giving testimony myself about the evils of alcohol. And again, from Ebby's mouth, everybody sat in wonder of me. I had them spellbound. When he told me that the next morning, I was absolutely mortified because I knew I didn't believe a word of whatever it was I said. I just knew that I could never go back to Manhattan again. The idea of some drunk coming up and saying to me, you were great the other night at the mission, it appalled me. I also realized that this was really the onset of the insanity of alcohol and I was on a downward slide that would never, ever, ever be the same again. I was finished. And he didn't argue, he left. He said, you had me convinced. Going out the door, I said, Bill, you had me convinced. I thought you had it. And I sat home, really feeling sorry for myself. Lois is at work. And then I realized something that I hadn't realized earlier that morning. When Lois was going off, I, I reached into my trousers pocket and I took out money. And I turned it over to her. I realized that I had never done that in years. I never came home with money. I spent every dime I had before I come home. I'd be dead broke. I couldn't go buy a bar with a dime. Apparently something did happen. What it was, I don't know, but I knew that if I was ever gonna pull myself back from the abyss that I was on, I had to find out. So I decided I would get sober. I would sober up and go back to the Oxford group and really take a good look. Now, how do you get sober? With my experience, you go into town's hospital. My brother-in-law paid, always paid, the $125 it took for the five days to sober me up. Well, I don't know about you, but if you're going to get sober, you should get drunk first. No one's going into the hospital with a hangover. What a waste of $125. And it seems I was foolish enough to give my money away to my wife. I only had six cents, a penny and a nickel. And I took a nickel to get it on the subway. So I realized you can't get drunk even in Brooklyn on a penny. So what I did do is I got dressed and I went out and I scrounged around a few of the stores in Brooklyn Heights until I came up with the one store that would give me credit. And actually it was Lois's credit. And on her tick, I got four bottles of beer. Drank two right away because I was very thirsty. Wound up trying to give one away on the subway to a stranger. He wouldn't take it, so I drank that. And then wound up finally walking into Townsend's Hospital, waving the one bottle of beer over my head that I had left, spotted Dr. Silkworth, and in a drunken state said to him, Doc, I found the cure. And he took one look at me, took one look at the bottle, and he said, I see you have, my boy. You know where your bed is go upstairs and get into it. And I knew where my bed was. And I went upstairs, undressed, finished the little beer, and went to bed. Three days later, free of sedatives, free of alcohol, I lay in that bed full of remorse now. Self-pity, anger, rage, and total, absolute humiliation. I realized that I had just done another terrible thing. I had no intention of checking out the Oxford group, drunk or sober. No intention. I just cost my brother another $125, and I also cost my wife not to speak to me. What a terrible, terrible thing to do. When I looked up and standing in the door, it was my friend Eddie. And the first thing I said to myself was, here's a fellow that practices what he preaches. I heard the staff mention how cold it was when they were coming in on shift, and here was my friend come out in that cold to see me. And all I could say was, here's a fellow that really works his program. And all he said to me is, gee, Bill, I'm sorry to see you in here again. I really thought you had it the other day, but I guess I was mistaken. If you need any help, please don't hesitate to give me a call. And he seemed to go, I said, wait a minute, Abby. What was that little neat formula you had that you got from the Oxford people that got you sober? He said, simple. He said, you get honest, you talk it over with somebody else. You make up for the harm you've done. Help other people, and you ask God for help. Whatever God you come up with to do those four things.
And he mentioned the G.O.D. word again, and I said, thanks, but no thanks. I still gagged at the idea of a personal gun. What a joke. What a waste. And I lay in that bed, and the evening wore on, and it got darker and darker in that room until finally, in almost total darkness, in that bed of pain, I sank into one of the worst depressions of my life. And I was no stranger to depression, but this was one of the worst. I kept going down and down and down until finally it felt that I was at the bottom of a pit, a deep, dark pit. And then, for one brief moment, again, one of those moments that Pete mentioned when he introduced me, for one brief moment, my proud obstinacy left me, and I, I found myself crying out more, more in anger, I think, than in pain. If there is a God, let him show himself to me right now. I will do anything anything. Let him show himself to me. The room lit up in an intense white light, and I was caught up in an ecstasy that words cannot describe. In my mind's eye, it was as if I were on a mountaintop, and a wind, not of air, but of spirit, flowed through my body. And it burst upon me that I was a free man. The obsession to drink left me. That obsession that absolutely pervaded my total being left me. Eventually the ecstasy subsided and now I found myself back in that hospital bed, but this time surrounded in a presence, a, a presence of pure joy. And I realized, this, this number one man, that I was a part, if only a tiny part, of a universe ruled in justice and love by a loving, compassionate, personal God. And all I could say was, so this is the God of the preachers. This is what they've been talking about all these years. Eventually, I have one of these inquiring rational minds. And eventually, the, the, the mind began to say, My God, Bill, this is the granddaddy of all hallucinations. This was that slide into madness that Dr. Silkworth talked about. This was the end. And I became frightened. So frightened that I got the nurse and I asked her to get Dr. Silkworth. And she did. He came and sat alongside my bed and I told him what happened to me. And he listened, and finally, I don't know where the courage came from, I said to him, Doctor, is this it? Am I going insane? And after a few minutes, his brow furrowed, and he looked up to me and he said, No, my boy. No, I have never witnessed what has happened to you. But I read about it in books, and it does sober up drunks, and I can tell you it's all you got. I saw you a short time ago, and I wouldn't have given you a tinker's damn for your life, but something has happened, and you better hang on to it. Because again, it's all you have. And he left, and I slept like a baby. Next morning, I told Abby what happened, and he went out and came back a few minutes later, and with him, he brought a book called The Variety of Religious Experiences by Dr. James, the Harvard psychologist. And he said, Bill, you'll find what happened to you in this book. It's the toughest book I ever read, but I devoured it, absolutely devoured it. And then I did discover what had happened to me, the cash value of my experience, I call it, the scientific truth. This doctor had chronicled a number of experiences, some the illuminating type that I had, the sudden, sudden one that overcomes people. And then he also went on to illustrate the gradual experiences that other people have over a period of time through the help of other people or in fellowship or in service. They all undergo a transformation, a conversion. But the one thing that they all have in common, the one key ingredient, is a state of calamity. They are all in a, a sense of powerlessness and hopelessness before anything like this can occur. And this is what happened to me. I had had this sudden illuminating experience. And then typically alcoholic, I said, but why me? Why did this happen to me? And then I realized my drinking had so isolated me that it was as if I were in a cave. And my friend, Ebby, well, first, my family over the years, and my wife in particular, stood outside that cave asking me to come out. And I couldn't get out. I couldn't find my way out, and finally, Ebby, he showed up outside the cave, and finally, after having been a captive in a similar cave, he entered mine. He knew the way. He took me by the hand, and he led me out. One cave dweller helping another, one alcoholic helping another. And I knew that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to help other people like myself. I left the hospital. I joined the Oxford group. And I came forth. And the next six months, I talked to thousands of drunks, and nobody, I mean nobody, listened to what I had to say. I couldn't sober up a soul. 
because I was convinced if anybody had an undergo experience like mine, they had to be on top of a mountain, have this bright light, and the wind not a very go through their body. They ran away from me, all convinced that what had happened to me was nothing more than a hallucination. Some of them used to jokingly say, Bill, tell us what you were drinking that day so we can avoid it. That was my total experience. Finally, in desperation, I went back to see Dr. Silkworth, and he told me, after I asked him the advice, he said, Bill, I first said to him, I'm sorry, why can't I help people, Doc? I said, my friend can help me, Abby can help me, and I can't help others. Why can't I do that? And he said, Bill, I'm going to give you some advice. You can take it or leave it. I've listened to you talk to some of our patients here, and I want to suggest that you lay off the business. Don't talk about God to a drunk. Talk drunk to a drunk. And after you make the connection, one alcoholic talking to another, talking about the lies and the losses, and the deceit and the pain and the anguish and the heartbreak. Once you make that connection, then talk about the spiritual program. But make the connection first. And I began to do that and they stopped running away. Nobody got sober, but they stopped running away. And then friends, family friends, began to say, hey, when is Bill going to go back to work and get Lois out of that damn department store? And I heard it. And I realized that they were right. I wasn't any good in the drunk business, so I began to look for some action down on the street and finally I heard of a deal going down in Akron and I cut myself in for a piece of the action but folks before I go to Akron I gotta stop for please a turn your cassette over now for the conclusion thank you oh no good rich friends and vice versa and here we were a bunch of New Yorkers coming into town to take over a, one of their pet companies so nobody cooperated with us we couldn't get an inside track to work on that's what you need if you're going to win a proxy battle. And then another group, a rival group, came in from Chicago, and as they were Midwest Midwesterners, they had a, I guess you'd say, the inside track, and they wound up winning the uh, proxy battle. We lost. And my investors decided to go back to New York and call it quits. They had something to go back, though, and I, I didn't. This was my chance, if this had been successful, to really turned my life around. I was to be made president of that company and with a handsome salary, sufficient to get me out of debt and get Lois out of that damn department store. But here we were, uh, we had failed. But I, I asked them if they'd allow me to stay for a few days to sort of uh, reconnoiter and find out if there was any malfeasance or misfeasance on behalf of the, the winning company. And if there was, we could sue them for the illegality and perhaps get back our expenses with maybe even a little profit. My partners had nothing to lose. The hotel was paid forward for a few days, so they said, go ahead. If you want to stay, that's up to you. And they left, and I stayed behind. And that's how I found myself that, that Saturday in May, 1935, day before Mother's Day, walking up and down the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, pacing. At one end was the desk clerk, and at the other end was the hotel bar. And I just walked backwards and forwards, waiting for Monday, waiting to go to work. Feeling very, very sorry for myself because it was a failure. Mine was a, a last gasp. Finally, I found myself no longer pacing, but I was standing outside of the bar, and I, I, I was listening to the noises that a bar makes and all the nostalgia that it was creating inside of me. And finally, I, I, I decided that I'd go in and have a glass of ginger ale and strike up a conversation, thereby passing the day. And as soon as I said it, I realized what had happened to me on that trip to Staten Island. And I, I realized further that I didn't want a glass of ginger ale. I wanted to get drunk. I had $10 in my pocket. And believe me, $10 in those days, you could be king for a day in Akron with $10. But I also had been sober long enough, or without a drink long enough, to realize that I should be frightened by the way I was thinking, and I was frightened. I was rationalizing, and that frightened me. And then I thought, well, what's been keeping me sober? Why am I sober if, if I can still think this way? And I further realized that it was working with drunks, working with other men like myself that uh, kept me from drinking. That's what had worked. Even though they didn't get sober, I stayed sober. And I said, if I could find a drunk to work on. By God, I need him more than he needs me. I need to find a drunk to talk to. But I was a stranger in town. I knew nobody. 
I couldn't meet at the bar and ask somebody if they wanted my help. They'd beat me up. I went back to pace him. And then after a few minutes, for no reason that I know of, I found myself reading a church directory in the center of the hotel lobby. And at the bottom of the directory, there was one name that just leapt out at me. The Reverend Walter Tunks. As a boy growing up in Vermont, when we took a walk in the woods, we took a tunk. And that was hunch enough for me. I bet on that hunch. I went over and I dropped a nickel into the phone and I dialed. And the Reverend Tunks answered the phone. And for those of you that are bowlers, it was what you'd call a 10 strike. I had called the number one fan of the Oxford groups in Akron, Ohio. I told him my plight, what I wanted, that I was a run hound from New York here on business, that I'd been sober for six months, I was a member of the Oxford group, and I think I could help another drunk. Did he know any? Well, he was at first hesitant. He could deal with drunks one at a time. He didn't know if he could handle them two at a time. But finally he said, I, I don't know uh, any drunks. I'm sorry. He said, but I, if I, even if I did, in confidence, I couldn't share their names. But I do know members of the Oxford group. Here, let me give you their names and numbers. And with that, he gave me ten names of ten members of the Oxford group. I went and cashed a dollar, and I got 20 nickels. I went back to the phone booth, and I sat down, and I began to dial those numbers. I went through the first nine in a matter of maybe 10 or 15 minutes. And they were either not home, or they knew nobody that I could help, or they hung up on me. Simple as that. Finally, I was down to my last name, and I took a deep breath, and I dropped the nickel in. And I caught a man who was busy packing his bags, leaving town for the weekend. He was already late. I told him my story, and he listened. He said, I'm sorry I can't help you. I don't know any. But he said, here, call this woman. Perhaps she can help you. And he gave me her name. And my heart sank. Her name was Henrietta Cyberling. I said, my God, this has got to be Frank Cyberling's wife, the fellow that spotted Goodyear. I knew him. We were members of the same clubs in New York. I couldn't call him up and say, hey, this is Bill Wilson. Do you remember me from New York? I'm now a drunk. Uh, do you know any drunks or does your wife know any drunks that I could help? I couldn't call. I just couldn't put myself to do it. The more I sat in that booth thinking about this, the more I realized that if I didn't, I'd get drunk. Finally, taking another deep breath, I dropped the nickel in and I dialed the number. And Henry had an answer. Henry, we called. And I told him my story and what I wanted. All she said was, come right over. And she gave me the address. And I came right over. She wasn't Frank Cyberling's wife. She was his daughter-in-law, soon to be ex-daughter-in-law. She was in the process of divorcing the young heir. She was living in the gatehouse. She wasn't in the mansion. She was down by the side of the road. She had moved there so her children could be close to their father. She had embraced the Oxford group several years before when this divorce process began to get the help that they offered. You see, the Oxford group was not a religion. It was a non-denominational fundamental movement that uh, sort of tried to practice a kind of Christianity they felt belonged shortly after the death of Christ, in the years right after the death of Christ, when there was no hierarchy and there were no rules or regulations. It was just people helping people through all types of crises and helping with their faith. That's more or less what the Oxford group was. They met together, they shared, they had gatherings. We called them house parties or drawing room conversations. And people just prayed and meditated together and helped each other through difficult spots. And that's what Henry had joined it a couple of years before when she got into the divorce process. And they had helped her a great deal and she was very active in the movement. And two weeks before my visit to Akron, and before my call to her, at one of their sharings, a doctor, a well-known surgeon in Akron, told his group that he had a drinking problem. It was his deepest, darkest secret, and he shared it with the group. Yet everybody in town knew it. Everybody in town knew that Dr. Bob Smith had a problem with alcohol. But to him it was a deep, very, very deep, dark secret. Bob used to tell us of himself there was a, a joke in the medical societies that you see, he was a rectal surgeon, a proctologist. They had a, an inside story about him that you bet your ass when you went to Bob Smith because you never knew if he was going to be drunk or sober. And yet, when he shared this, he was sharing his soul. Well, Henry, because she was especially fond of Bob and of his wife, she took to praying for him. 
she, he became very, very active in her prayers. She asked God to help him. And then, out of the blue, she gets a call from me saying that I can help drunks. And all she could say was, this is manna from heaven, come right over. And I came over and she interviewed me. She interviewed me to find out if I wasn't indeed a drunk. Now, I've had interviews in my life where I had to prove I wasn't a drunk, and here I was trying to prove to a total stranger that I did indeed have a problem with alcohol. And when she was convinced, she went over to the phone and she, she called Ann Smith and said, Ann, I've got a fellow here from New York that can help drunks bring Bob over. And Ann hemmed and hoard for a few minutes and came up with a couple of lame excuses about why they couldn't come over, but Henry would hear none of it. She, she finally wore her down until Ann had to tell the truth. She said, Henry, we can't come over. Bob came home this afternoon with a potted plant for me for Mother's Day and put it on the kitchen table. And now, as he's more potted than the plant, he's under the table. I couldn't wake him up if his life depended on it. Well, Henry wasn't going to be put off for that. She said to her, listen, Ann, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get this fellow to come back tomorrow. You bring Bob over for dinner tomorrow at 5 o'clock, and we'll get these two fellows together. And she asked me if I could come over, and I said, certainly. I had no place to go until Monday morning. So I went back to the hotel, passed a peaceful night the next day. I walked around town for a while, and then eventually walked out to that, that lovely little gatehouse on Portage Road to meet, to meet my friend, Bob Smith. First look I got out of me was a mess, absolute mess, coming off a drunk. I guess I said the right thing. I said, uh, I bet you could use a, drunk, a drink. I sort of softened him up a little bit. He, I guess he said, here's a guy that knows what he's talking about. We went immediately into the dining room to begin supper, supper, but Bob was shaking so badly at the table, the food scattering all over the place, that I took sympathy for him, and I, I said, come on, we can eat later. Let's go in and have a chat. And I could see he was grateful. He, he knew what he looked like, and he knew how he was acting. So we got up, and we went into a little study, or a library, if you want to call it, that little tiny room that... Henry kept, and Bob and I sat down to talk. Now, on the way over, he said to Annie, his wife, he said, I'll give this bum 15 minutes, and then you come in and announce that there's been a train wreck or a plane wreck, but get me out of there. He would do anything she wanted him to do when he was coming off a drunk, but he, he did have limitations, and there wasn't anybody from New York could sober him up. Well, before we began, I, thank God, I recall what Dr. Silkworth had said, and I began to practice that advice. But I started off by saying to him, Doc, I said, I need your help. And he was taken back a minute and he said, what do you mean need your help? I thought you were gonna help me. And I said, no, I, I truly, I need your help. If I don't talk to you, I'll get drunk. And following Silky's advice, I told Bob my story, blow by blow. And he listened and shook his head, nodded, Every once in a while, he'd say something himself. And I talked about the disease of alcoholism to a man who was in medicine for over 30 years. And he listened to every word I said because it was all news to him. And that 15 minutes lasted for five hours. And when it was over, we went outside and returning to the ladies, he put his arm around my shoulder and he said to his wife, Anne, he said, honey, can we bring him home with us? I think he can help me. And she said, sure. A few days later, when my bill had run out at the hotel, I moved into Ardmore Avenue with Ann and Bob Smith and their children, Sue and Bob Jr. I was given young Bob's bed. He was put on a cot. I was made Uncle Bill to the children right away. And the love and the joy and the beauty and the grace and the wonder that came out of that hallowed home I will never find equaled again on the face of the earth. Every morning we would, the three of us, Ann, Bob, and I would go up to a little sewing room that she kept upstairs and we'd sit after breakfast and say our prayers and read from the good book and meditate and share for an hour. And it always ended with Annie saying, faith without works is dead. And I'd go off to work to find out if there was anything done illegal to us, which there never was. 
and Bob would go off to whatever practice he had left, and Anne would stay home, keeping house and watching the children. And then in the evening we'd come back, have dinner, and then Bob and I would go to an Oxford group meeting, or if there were none, we'd go for a walk, and we'd talk, and we'd share, and we'd talk about this, the significance of one alcoholic helping another, and perhaps there was great merit to this, and that perhaps we could set up a kind of a chain reaction helping other people. And after a couple of weeks, Bob got sober. It was wonderful, truly wonderful. Then one morning at breakfast, he announced to Ann and I that he was going to attend the AMA convention in Atlantic City. He hadn't missed one in 30 years, and he wasn't going to miss one now that he was sober. And Annie begged him, please don't go. You know what those things turn out to be. And he said, no, honey, I've got to go. I've got to prove that this works. This fellow pointing to me, he can't stay in Akron forever. He's got to go back and get a job. And he was right. The deal was dead. I had to go home and look for work. He said, I've got to go test this out. And if it works, then he can leave. And I agreed finally. That was a good idea. Let's see if he could fly. And Bob left for Atlantic City. And as he told the story, he he began drinking as the train pulled out of the station. We found him uh, five days later. Uh, one of his ex-nurses and her husband had found him in a bar in downtown Akron and brought them home to their house in a suburb north of the city. And they tried to get him sober, but he only got worse. So finally, in desperation, they called us to get him and bring him home. I was heartbroken. On the ride over, I was just, just sick at heart. Annie, though, said, Bill, would you please, could you stay and help me get him well again because he has an operation to perform in a few days and if he fails to do that we we will lose the operating theater and if we lose that theater we're going to lose the hospital and it's the only one left in town that will allow him to practice if he loses that we have to go bankrupt that's how bad they were that's how broke they were and for her sake I agreed to do it we brought him home and he was a mess and after gallons of coffee, and I used to have a, <laughs> a hangover cure. I even tried to get it patented once. Uh, cold sliced tomatoes, sauerkraut juice, and carob syrup. We shovel that down his throat. And whatever stayed down, I guess, got him sober. I walked him up and down, up and down Ardmore Avenue in front of the house. And after a few days, Bob got well. Well enough, anyway, to go in and do the operation. I drove him in. Driving in, uh, he was shaking so badly, I, I stopped and got him a bottle of beer. I said, here, take this to study in it. And he drank it down. He was grateful. We went to the hospital, and he got out, and he was walking up the steps, when all of a sudden he stopped, and he returned to the car, and he leaned down, looked in the window, and he said to me, I'm going to go through with this. And I said, go through with it? What do you think I've been around here for? I mean, I was sick of him. I really was. I, go through with it. Go ahead. Get it over with. And he left, and I drove home to wait for him to call for me to come and get him. That was 7 o'clock in the morning. 10 o'clock came, and there was no Bob. 12 o'clock, no Bob. 2 o'clock, no Bob. I made arrangements to get a train that evening to go back to New York. He was drunk. Forget about it. Anne was brokenhearted. 5 o'clock, we heard a cab pull into the driveway. Anne went over and peered through the curtains and she said it's him I said how does he look and she said I, I can't tell Ronnie walked in the door and he put his bag down and there's that pregnant moment that pause you, you spouses of us you, you know the regiment you know, you know what it's like there was that pause when nobody can say a word and then finally Annie said honey honey where have you been we've been worried sick where had he been? He'd been all over the city of Akron to everybody and to anybody that he had ever harmed or to whom he owed money to. And he made amends to each and every one of them, telling them all that he was an alcoholic. And that's what he meant when he said he was going through with this. He was beginning to practice one of those steps that we had taken from the Oxford group. And that was the 10th of June in 1935, and he never drank again. 
And I didn't go home to New York that night. I stayed. I was so happy. The next morning he said to me, you know, Willie, you and I are not going to stay sober talking to each other. We need to must find another drunk to help. Are you game? Can you stay a little while longer? And I said, sure. I was so thrilled. He went over to the phone, he picked it up, and he called the Akron Hospital. He said, hey, he said, I have a fellow here from New York that's got a cure for drinking. Is there anybody down there we can talk to? And the smart Alex nurse said, what about you, Doc? He really has. He said, are you sober? He said, yes. Well, that's good enough for me. She said, we have a fellow right now, young southern boy, lawyer, used to be part of the city council. We got him tied down in bed. He just blackened the eyes of the head nurse. Been on a terrible drunk. He's going to be committed to the Ohio State Hospital when he gets out of here. Self-committed. Will he do? And Smitty said, yes, so he'll do fine. Thank you. Uh, give him some sedatives and we'll be down by and by. And then without my realizing or knowing anything about it, he had the man put into a private room so we could get him out of the ward and talk to him in private. At his expense. And that evening we went down and we met the, the man in the bed. Now, in those days, when you were taken out of a ward and put in a private room, it meant usually only one thing. You were dying. So we showed up. This fellow was frightened out of his wits. I mean, the sweat was pouring off his body. He was tied into the bed. I mean, if he could sunk through the mattress, he would have. His eyes were bulging out of his head. And when we stepped in the door, as far as he was concerned, we were two undertakers come to measure the body. He was that frightened. It took us a minute or so to reassure him that we weren't what he thought we were. Finally, he settled down, and we each of us told him our story about what it was like, what happened, and what it was like, which is what we were doing right now. And he listened, the eyes going one to the other, one to the other, his arms outstretched, tied to each side of the bed, looking up at us, and you could see the peace of God settling over him as he began to realize that indeed he wasn't dying. Finally, when we finished, we said, what do you think? And looking up at us, he said, gee, fellas, I'm, I'm happy for both of you, but it's too late for me. I wish you all the luck in the world, but I'm a goner, he said. I, I dare not leave here. I'll kill somebody on my next trunk. I'm sure of it. I've asked to be committed into the Ohio State Hospital. It's too late for me, but I, I wish you all the luck in the world. He said, I, I didn't give up on God. God gave up on me. Well, we couldn't fight that. We had no tools to combat that. We turned to go. And I don't know to this day if it was Bob or I, but one of us went back to the bed and said, listen, maybe, maybe we missed something. Could we come back and talk to you again, perhaps, to spend a few more minutes. Maybe we could cover some other points. He said, oh, please do. Please come back. If it helps you, uh, absolutely, come back. He said, you know how lonely this drying out gets. They don't come near us from one minute of the day to the next, he said. They hate us. They hate the sight of us. They hate the sound of us. They hate the smell of us. Oh, please come back. Please, I I'd like it if you would. Well, we had a half a sale. It wasn't a complete sale, but we could talk to him again and we felt good about that. We left. A few days later, we came back, and now this time he's back in the ward. He's not in a private room. We stepped into the doorway, and he spots us. He's sitting up in bed talking to his wife. And he lets out a roar, there they are! I mean, he's, there they are! I mean, he screamed so loudly, there was a fellow, I think, that certified as dead, got up and left. A nurse dropped her tray. We rushed down, trying to quiet him down. He was jumping up and down saying over and over again, it wasn't a dream, it wasn't a dream. These are the men that I was talking about. There was somebody pointing to us. These men did come to see me. He had thought it all was a figment of his drunken imagination. He pointed to me, he said to his wife, honey, this man, he said, is a stockbroker. Come here on business. Come to see me. He's a drunk just like me. And pointed to Smitty, he said, and this guy, he said, honey, he's a Heine doctor right here in the hospital. Come to see me. Tell her, he said, tell her what you told me. I haven't been able to get the sight of you two men out of my mind. 
tell her what you told me. And we each of us in turn told her again our stories. And throughout our whole telling, he kept saying over and over again, see, I told you, I told you. And when we finished, he said, honey, get my clothes, I'm going home. And his name was Bill D., AA number three. And we had our first group. We were three. That still meets today. Still meets in Akron. We had something. And what made it most important is we had somebody that wasn't a member of the Oxford group. He was a stranger to it. And yet he, he understood what it is we were talking about. It was a wonderful time to be alive. Two years later, there were 40 of us. Most of them in Akron and some with me in New York. 40 men, sober, six months or more. We listed their names one night at the kitchen table back in Akron. I was there on business. Bob said, you know, the rate we're going, we'll have a 1,000 by the year 2000. We must organize. We must get this spread around a lot better. And for that, we need money. And Bill, you're the expert in the money. You better raise some money because we've got to get this message across. And I went and tried to raise money, and that's another story and another night. But it was a disaster. Finally, somebody suggested that we write a book. If you want to make money, write a book. Well, we borrowed some money and begged some money and sold some small trusts that we had. And we opened up the Works Publishing Company, and we set about writing a book. None of us with any experience at all in doing just that. I wrote my chapter and a few other words and Bob wrote his and Silky contributed some and members both in New York and Akron and Cleveland wrote their stories and we had the makings of a book. We had something we thought could sell. The only ingredient missing was how it worked. None of us, and I mean none of us, clearly understood how it worked. Sure, we had six steps. We had taken the five original ones and we added the first one, of course, which were powerless over alcohol and that our lives were unmanageable. But that's all we had. We had no really process or something to speak about. Whenever anybody would ask us, how does this thing work? We always would just say, fine, it works fine. How does it work? One night, one evening actually, a group of fellas, myself included, were sitting around our place in Brooklyn Heights, my brother-in-law's place. Lois was still working in that damn department stuff. Drinking her coffee, feet up on her furniture. And we were talking about how it works and what we had to put into this book. Because the book had to get published. We were broke. Absolutely, totally broke. And we were in debt. Bob, the worst of all of us. He was going to lose everything. We're sitting around and we were talking about the idea that if we were going to make it a bestseller, we need to must keep God out of it. This was 39 now, and this is uh, the year that the World's Fair opened up, and it was the, the world of tomorrow, and science was selling. Anything on science was selling. So we'd make it a scientific book. We wouldn't make it a, a religious book or a spiritual book. We'd downplay that and talk about science. And I was in agreement. I mean, I wanted to get something to sell because we needed the money. And Lois came home from work, and while she was in making another pot of coffee, she overheard this conversation. And then all of a sudden, there was a loud crash in the kitchen, and she came out, and she was so angry, she threw everybody out of the house. Everybody, with the exception of me. I lived there. And finally, she came over to me, and in her anger, she pointed her finger up into my nose, and she said, Mister, you're going to get drunk. She was quivering. You're going to get drunk. I said, what makes you say that? So because you forgot who got you sober. With that, she left, went upstairs. I'd never seen her that angry before, so I wasn't going to follow her. I just let her cool off, and I stayed downstairs. And we used to have a little room underneath the staircase that I liked to go in and do my meditating. And I went in, and I lay down on the cot there, and I began to think about what she had said. For God who got me sober. And I began to think back in all the moments in my life when there was something that was outside of myself that gave me direction and help. I began to think of all the truths that we had learned from the Oxford group and all the things that Bob had shared with me over the four years. And finally, I reached up and I took down the 
clipboard that I kept over the bed, and I began to write. When I finished, I had taken those six ideas that we had, and I cut them into smaller pieces until finally I had 12 steps. And in the second step, I identified God, and the third step, I called him by name. And I stopped at number 12 for only one reason. There had been 12 apostles, so I figured if that was good enough for him, it would be good enough for us. I got up and I came out of the room, and as it happened, a couple of fellows had come back to the house and were finishing up Lois's coffee, sitting up in the parlor, and I, I sat down with them. And now, I knew that the book had to be published, and this had to be going to it, and we, we had to get it done, so I was not going to book an argument. Although we operated from group conscience, I knew that this, this had to be done this way. So I told them that this is what we were going to go forward with. I read them the 12 steps, and they listened, and they said, no argument, Bill. No argument. And the one lad said, uh, would you mind, though, if, if you would add that whenever you use the word God, would you also say, as we understood him? And I said, okay. And we had 12 steps, and we had a book. The only thing missing was the title. I, in all modesty, suggested the Bill Wilson movement, but I got shot down right away. Somebody else had suggested the way out, and I liked that. That had a neat, a neat ring to it. But we had a friend going down to Washington on a business trip, and he checked in with the patent office, and it turned out that there were already 12 titles, the way out. We didn't want to be number 13. So we went back to the drawing board. Now, there were 100 men sober then in 1939, so somebody suggested, let's call it 100 men. And that had another nice ring to it, and I thought that'd be great. And wouldn't you know if the first woman showed up? We couldn't say 100 men plus a woman because people would say, what happened to women? So we went back to the drawing boards. So one night at a meeting, they brought a fellow in from Bellevue, and just almost out of his mind, and he was babbling throughout the whole meeting. Anonymous alcoholics, anonymous alcoholics. Finally, I had to pick him up and bring him back to the hospital, where he eventually died. And I like the ring of that, and so do some other people. But then, when we were going to call the book Anonymous Alcoholic, somebody said, no, no, put the alcoholic first. Put him first. So we named the book Alcoholics Anonymous, which became the name of our society. And we printed 5,000 copies and sold 102. The girl bought two. Couldn't give them away. But again, that's another night and another story. Please invite me back if you want to hear about it. It's a lot of laughs. But today now we're 100,000. I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of these books we have sold. But we began to grow. Thank God. Now this book, it's merely a suggestion. We don't have all the answers. Believe me, we don't. Just see to it, you know, when, when you say your prayers in the morning, Ask God, what can I do for the, the guy or the gal that is still suffering? And the answers will come if your own house is in order. But trust me, you can't give away what you don't have. See to it that your relationship with him is right. You know, turn yourself over to his care. Admit your faults to another. Clear away all the damage you've done in your life. And be active, help other people, and, and have a full, wholesome, beautiful life. AA is a, an utter simplicity encased in a mystery that nobody, I mean nobody, understands perfectly. Least of all I. Nobody understands it. Our strength comes from our weakness, the fact that we know what we are. We know our weakness. That's where we gain our strength. We must, we need we need to achieve some some form of humility before we're gonna have any kind of a resurrection. And pain nobody likes the word, but pain's not only the price we have to pay, it's the touchstone the touchstone of, of, of any spiritual rebirth. The uh, this group is celebrating its first anniversary. I, I really mean this. Be grateful for that and be grateful for the experience that it's brought about.
but don't. Don't depend upon it for one minute for the needs of today. The art of life is to live one minute, one day, one moment at a time, and to make that moment, that day, as perfect as you can. I want to thank you. To, I'm beginning to preach now, so I want to stop. I want to thank you for allowing me to, to share some of the moments of our life, yours and mine, because you're all a part of it. And I, I, I realize now that my friends, my wife, were right when they said that uh, I should come here tonight and share our story. It has done me a world of good. I would hope that you... Where did I put my coat? Oh, here it is. I would hope that you would invite me back again when I come back from Akron because I will need your support more than ever then. I, uh, I miss him already. You know, Bob and I, uh, we were both from Vermont. Uh, uh, he was raised 50 miles away from my home. He's 15 years my senior. He was from an aristocracy. His father was a judge. We were country bumpkins. I was born in a saloon. Uh, he was a physician, Bob. He was trained to accept people the way they were and to work with them as they were. Me, all my life, I'm a promoter, a seeker. I've been always reaching out for for something new. My spirituality, my, my quest for truth is something that has hounded me. But Bob, my friend, he was always nearer to the truth, nearer to the truth of things, nearer to the power I sought. He found that in his simple approach to life, and I think that placed him closer to our creator than any man I've ever known. I guess that was needed to get this thing going. Bob's simple inner life and mine to which I guess nothing is ever going to be simple. I'm grateful that I was uh, able to be in Akron this weekend with Bob. We had some piece of business, AA business, that you're going to hear more, more about in the springtime to do with the Board of Trustees. And I went out to talk to him about it. For those of you who were at the convention in Cleveland last July, you witnessed his last talk. You'll never hear a finer speech in all the history of AA where he could take these, these 12 steps and cut them down to two words, love and service. It's beyond me. But that was what Bob could do. Bob was a, a surgeon. He was always able to cut things down to size. Well, I was with him, and I want you to know, although he was in a great deal of pain and a great deal of suffering, I had all his attention. I had all of his energy and all of his calm reassurance. People have said to me over the years, you know, Bill, you're the heart of AA. <laughs> if I'm the heart of AA, then Bob was its soul. And the blood of my heart. Well, anyway, when the meeting was over, I had to go catch a train back to New York, and I... I walked out, and he followed me. And as we got by the hall closet, he stopped for a minute. He said, wait a minute, Bill. He said, here. And he reached up into the closet, and he took down this here, this, this old Irish country hat that he'd worn so many years. And, and he handed it to me. He said, here, Bill, put this on. Wear it. It's raining outside. and I don't want you to get sick. You've got too much work to do. Now, for those of you that are not aware of it, there's a history between, between Bob and I and this hat. I have wanted it. For 15 years, since the first day I laid eyes on it. I swiped it a number of times. Lois kept mailing it back to him, but here he was giving me this, his face. I, I just couldn't say a word. I, I said, maybe I keep my mouth shut or she'll change his mind. And I, I turned and I went, and I was walking down the path to the cab, and for some reason I turned back, and he had followed me out on the porch. He was standing there, and he had that, that beautiful, broad grin of his, and he was smiling. And all he said to me is, don't laugh this thing up, Bill. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. My God, he, he'd been saying that forever. This is my, my friend, my partner for 15 years, a man I never had a hard word with. And he said, keep it simple. I turned away, little realizing that it was going to be the last time I would see him alive. And I did know it. I wish I had. And then tonight, coming here to 
to talk to you, I reached up into my hall closet to take down this hat. And only then I realized that, that although I didn't know it, Bob knew it. You see, it wasn't raining in Akron that night. He just found a loving, simple way to say goodbye. And in so doing, in so doing, showing me again how simple this program was. All we do is pass things on.